Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of BIM After Dark Live. Um, as you may notice, it's not dark, and uh, I'm not standing in my room with some guitars behind me. <laughs> so uh, I want to thank you guys for joining me today. Uh, unfortunately, um, my area of, of, uh, of the United States, uh, of Connecticut actually, got hit pretty hard with uh, the little tropical storm that came through. I Isaias, I think it is, I can't even pronounce it. Um, and I'm actually without power or internet, so I'm lucky enough to uh, use an office here. Um, to, to do this live stream. Um, today I'm just going to jump right into it. Uh, thank you all for joining me. Again, if you're returning, uh, thanks for coming back. If you, um, it's the first time here, then uh, this is a live show that I do every single week. This is actually episode 19. Believe it or not, next week is episode 20. Um, if you guys have any ideas of what I should do to celebrate 20 episodes of this thing, uh, shoot me an email or comment below. But um, uh, every week, uh, whether it's myself or I have a guest on, we run through BIM, Revit topics, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, and usually it's uh, Thursday nights at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, my guest today, uh, Andy, uh, who is, we'll introduce you guys uh, to in a second, he's actually in Dubai. And so we kind of modified the time a little bit <laughs> so that it wasn't uh, uh, too far in the middle of the night for him to join us. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, so with that, we're going to jump in. Andy's going to talk about some really cool stuff. I'm super excited. This is a topic, um, the topic of classical architecture in Revit. I get emails and, and questions about it all the time. And so um, Andy and I have been trying to get together to set this up for, for a month or so now, and we finally got a time and a date, and it's today. So uh, without further ado, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump in and introduce you guys to Andy, uh, Andy Milburn. And so uh, Andy, do you want to maybe just uh, introduce yourself a little bit, tell us a little bit about yourself? And thank you for joining, yeah, of course. Sure. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm Andy Milburn. I'm an uh, architect now in, based in Dubai. I've been in Dubai for 16 years now. Uh, before that, I was in Africa. I spent um, my, the prime of my life, I guess, in Africa, in Zimbabwe. I went there originally as a volunteer teacher, teaching building. And then uh, I went back to architecture, which had been my um, original intention um, as a student. I studied architecture for three years in London. And then I kind of uh, dropped out, gave it up, um, and became a bricklayer. So um, I spent my 20s working with my hands as a bricklayer and playing uh, playing in a band and um, having a good time. At the age of 30, I volunteered to go to Africa as a teacher. And then I went back to architecture as I was approaching 40, really. And I worked in Zimbabwe as a commercial architect there. Uh, which was very interesting, but um, eventually we hit a period of hyperinflation and political collapse. So I ended up in Dubai and I, I've been working as an architect in, in Dubai. Um, came across Revit about 14 years ago when I first came to Dubai. Or I, I knew of Revit, but I hadn't had a chance to use it. But I got the chance to get a license and then. Uh, um, so I've been like, uh, what I call myself a BIM addict. I have a little blog there, and um, yeah, that's. I think that's enough for me. Do, do you want to? Do you want to let people know uh, what the what the address to your blog is? It's a, uh, I believe, uh, Shades of Grey, right? It's called Shades of Grey. It's uh, gre uh, it's gravity dot blogspot dot com. It's gravity is is. Um, a combination of grey and revit into one word. That was the idea. <laughs> and, um, awesome. And so, uh, just just a little background as well. Uh, part of the part of the reason Andy, Andy and I reconnected. Um, so, you and I have known each other for a while now, but mostly it was just at conferences, right? At, at built or, yeah. or whatever revit technology conference, whatever we want to call it now. I know it's built now, but um, <laughs> and. Um, I think uh, about a, a couple months ago, somebody somebody reached out asking about Project Sone and uh, the Bank of England. Is that what it's called, right? The pro the project. Um, and and, and yeah, so the Bank of England. yeah, yeah. And so um, you know, you and I connected, trying you know, talking about that project, and that's when you you made mention about um, the new project, which uh, I believe you're going to talk about today. And uh, and we started discussing again, and and of course the, the other the other aspect of it too is whenever. Whenever somebody mentions classical architecture, 
um, in Revit and they ask me some questions, I always refer them to Paul Aubin's book, which I believe you were a part of. Um, your name's on the cover, I think, too, right? Or somewhere in the book. Uh, the yeah, Rena Renaissance Revit, Revit, I believe. The forward, I wrote the there forward. we go. There we go. Again, I met Paul at conferences, and we're we're all friends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. So, uh, so so Andy's here today to talk a little bit about that new project, which has to do with Notre Dame. So, uh, I guess I'll, I'll let you, uh, if you want to start sharing your screen and jump into it, because I know all the all the Revit geeks out there are pumped to see some cool modeling stuff. Um, also, to remind everyone out there, this is a live show, uh, unless you're watching it later because it is, is recorded uh, but normally it's a live show and so if you are here with us live um, then I urge you guys to uh, ask some questions and um, sorry I just want to remove that little symbol for you guys all right ask some questions along the way I'm gonna be I'm gonna be monitoring the chat chat while Andy goes along and um, and yeah with that Andy I don't know if you want to take it away I, I see your screen I believe everyone else sees your screen and uh, okay. yeah and so let, let's do this <laughs> All right, this is, so this is a model of um, Notre Dame de Paris, the, the cathedral there, which caught fire about 18 months ago, or not quite 18 months ago. And having worked on the Bank of England model before, which was a, a collaborative effort to reconstruct an old building, um, I just got the idea of having a quick go at Notre Dame, and people volunteered to join in and help and so on. So we, we, we started that. Um, we call ourselves as a group the way we build here. Um, the idea being using BIM, using Revit as a tool for exploring, for inquiring into interesting old buildings and um, thinking about human society in different places and times. Um, so this is a, a map which was prepared by um, Daniel Hertebisi in Paris, one of the group, one of our group. It's just um, a drafting view, um, filled regions. These pins are detailed items and they've got custom parameters which pick up people's names. So it's a very simple idea. There's a little schedule in there to just give um, an overview of, of the, the little cluster in the in the North America, uh, a little cluster in Europe, me over here in Dubai, and we've got Russell in, in uh, Australia, and that's the group. So if I quickly jump to the 3D before 3D, this is the current model. It's on BIM 360. This is live from BIM 360, um, which is what's really made possible to work as a group like this. Um, so I'm going to spin the model around. We have, just to go give an overview of the building, you have the, the west front here, the bell towers. Um, three major portals on the ground floor. This feature is called the Gallery of Kings. We have the West Rose here. In between the bell towers, and um, here, I mean, bell towers obviously a feature of European churches of the Middle Ages. Um, there's a, a, a kind of little courtyard behind an open arcade here, um, which has been operating, was operating as a, as a kind of viewing platform for tourists to go up um, and look over Paris. Um, and then there are doors going back into the roof space there. So I'll just give a quick overview of the, the building. Uh, it's about the, the, there's, this is the main, file and there is a link here there's a site a linked site so the main file is about 850 um, megabytes and the site's just 25 megabytes yeah. I actually it's, thought it would be a little bigger than 850 to be honest it's not that bad <laughs> it's yeah, big it's but it's not that bad, bad. It's, it's getting a little bit sluggish um, <laughs> with the Bank of England I was able to break it down into work sets and stuff because it was a, more of a spread out building, you could mm -hmm. turn some areas off and, and speed things up. It's a bit more difficult with this one to work out mm -hmm. what to unload. Because <laughs> it's kind of all one thing. Yeah, it? yeah. And I, I had a question too. You mentioned you know, it's on BIM 360. I mean, who, who, who else is working on this with you? Is it, it's a group of a few people, right, I believe? 
Yeah. So that so this was the contributor. These are these are the people who are in it. So. Oh right, right, yep. Um, the this little group. Of, so Francois um, and uh, Daniel Herdebisi there are quite active. Uh, Paul Orbin and Alfredo Medina, who I'm sure you know, mm -hmm. uh, have been quite active. They have been a bit quiet this last few months. They they contributed a bit. Uh, a lot earlier on. Uh, Ryan has do, done some interesting stuff. Mm. Um, and yeah, Marcel doesn't have a license anymore, but he did uh, some. <laughs> it's tough, so it, tough to do that without a license. The group and people coming in and out, there's no, um, no central telling people you do this and you do that. People mm. volunteer for what they're interested in doing, and that's what that's worked out very well. I, I, my principle is. If people should do what they're interested in, and mm -hmm. what they get excited about, and um, that, you know that's that's worked out fine. Awesome. So there are about a dozen of us, um, probably seven or eight major contributors, and other people chipping in here and there. So great, yeah. awesome. So I think uh, I think what I'm just going to keep keep checking the chat, see if there's any more questions. So guys, feel free to ask questions. Um, I think as, as you go through, I, I think your plan is to sort of go through the story of this model and, and, and I think you had a bunch of sequences yeah. here. So, so go ahead and keep jumping through and I'll, I'll just keep checking on the, on the chat for any, any other questions. All right. So this is a page I set up to show how we set up. In the first place, we had a, I had some plan drawings that I got off the internet and I set out just a regular grid of that estimated the size from Google Earth and started building. My my role and my approach generally is to do kind of quick and dirty, I guess, and mm. jump in and flesh it and forge ahead and build up the model and then let people come in behind and do and model something more detail. Some, sometimes I get interested in the detail as well, but I think it needs somebody to try for a project like to drive it forward. So I set up a grid and then we've never had a point cloud. We've been trying to get a point cloud, but nobody seems to want to <laughs> release that data. Uh, it's a very sensitive project. Yeah. But what we have, there is um, a Likurve site, which was made public. Andrew Talon's point cloud is there, and it was made publicly available. So you can get in and look around, but you can't download the actual mm. point cloud. And what you see are the panoramic views, not the point cloud. But you can measure. Oh, OK from there and on that site we were able to download this JPEG which is like a horizontal a ground floor cut mm -hmm. um, which is fairly low resolution but it's it's quite a good guide to have to what's going on mm -hmm. so we gradually this page is a set of analyses really of what's going on so if I look at this one this is based on that um, point cloud section it's just a draft a 2d drafting object so there are filled regions and detail lines mm -hmm. and this is an attempt to get to map out the the miss the kind of the skewed grid it, if you wanted to do a really a grid which was picked up the skewed nature the distorted nature what would it look like and this mm -hmm. is an attempt to do that but in the event just as an exercise, but I think anybody who's done much work in Revit knows if something's like half a degree or one degree out of square, it's a nightmare. <laughs> yes. And for good reason, really. But, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have taken the view that we keep the grid orthogonal, mm -hmm. but bearing in mind the irregularities, that uh, we've adjusted it bit by bit to get um, something which which is as close as possible to the original. So this is the actual model now, simplified, you know, just with just the walls and stuff switched on and transparent, mm -hmm. with the JPEG below and the grid. Uh, it's not 100, there are some things that are not quite there, but everything is roughly the right proportion and the relationships are roughly there. So it was an interesting exercise to take a very irregular building and try to decide how are we going to build this right. in a way that explains it and understands it 
without wasting huge amounts of time trying to pick up every little deviation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. And, and making it uh, and making it a little easier in Revit. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, to make the whole thing. I mean, when you think about it, we we do this. We always do this. No, no Revit model. Every picks up. Ever picks up all the screws or all. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, it, you always have to think about. How am I going to simplify and abstract this mm -hmm. in order for the purpose we have in mind? Mm -hmm. you know? yep. How do we make the model fit for purpose? It's always a it, this is a slightly different case, but it is a question you always have to ask. Mm -hmm. So this is a view that Alfredo set up, um, nice. which is basically three three D views with different section box ah. pasted on a sheet together and carefully adjusted to give this kind of fake. Um, <laughs> Cut away. <laughs> oh, that, look, that looks fantastic. I was just going to say, I'm sure the first question we're going to get is, how is that made? So it's it's three views with three section boxes, and then you tick them together, and it looks like there's one little box cut away from it. Yes, and you have to be a little bit careful about the order in which you place the views mm -hmm. to get it to read. Yes, um, I that was uh, I was using Revit the other day, and I I I, uh, I was placing similar thing. I was I was overlaying 3D views, and I realized I never even thought about it, but there's no way to send view to back or front in Revit, right? It's it's whatever order you put them on is, is the order they stack up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the first one you put in, it goes to the back, and the next one goes on top, and then on top, mm -hmm. and top. Mm -hmm. so you, if no. you get it wrong, you have to start again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's a really, really cool looking view. It looks great. But it, it, it's, a, it's a very nice thing then. Um, I just one thing I'll point out here, which is that um, if you look at the rhythm of the columns going down, um, the nave and the width of the nave itself it's very different so the the bay size going sort of west to east there is less than half the bay side going across the nave mm -hmm. and this has an effect on the uh, vaults which go across the top which are these six part vaults mm -hmm. which is an interesting feature of, of this kind of gothic architecture mm -hmm. so um, Right. I did open these views in advance, but memory is uh, playing up. Yeah. It's gonna. Okay. Take, I, I can imagine it'd be. It'd, it'd start getting pretty slow. I mean, I'm. I'm. I'm thinking about. You know, how would I run this one on my machine? And I'm. I'm sure you'd be waiting for some views to open. <laughs> yes. I mean, when, when you're working on the model, you tend to be working in an area. Right? Mm -hmm. But when you're doing a talk like this, you want to jump from view to view, and that's when it. <laughs> mm -hmm. You really know the time lags more, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it is. It's not the. It's not a hugely responsive model. Obviously, it's quite a lot of detail. Right, right. Um, we will if it, if we go a lot further, we'll have to come up with some strategy for unloading stuff from memory. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So th this is a view there that we've got, sort of the ground floor windows. So you can see that I've been tagging the window types here to uh, so we're getting to the stage where we're trying to do these kind of window tagging and scheduling. Mm -hmm. Francois uh, in the south of France there has been working on these gothic tracery uh, windows of late. Uh, some of the original windows uh, I set up uh, which were much more simplified um, if we go in here Come back. <laughs> so these are my original windows. You can see they're quite yep. simple, but they're sort of parametric. You can do have different, a bit crudely, mm -hmm. crudely parametric. <laughs> but it's a quick way to to dot the window and to get to understand the building. And then Francois has been coming back and um, placing these um, windows, which if you look on the um, north facade. Um, you can see I won't zoom in again because of the thing but <laughs> you can see actually every window is slightly different as you go from yeah. something that difficult um, where the gothic is a bit different from the classical classical is always tends to be very symmetrical and regular mm -hmm. and gothic has a lot of this kind of funky details where so there was a there was a couple of questions I think can come into play with kind of what you're saying about the windows and 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 parameters. 
Um, somebody asked about how much, and I, maybe you'll get into this, so I'm sorry if I'm skipping ahead, but um, yeah, you know, uh, how, much, how, much, how much of this is modeled in place and how much of this is not. So I guess that kind of goes back to the idea of the families, you know, how, how much of this is, is uh, you know, families and parametric and you know, you know, outside of revenue, how much of it did you end up well, modeling in place? Very little, very little modeled in place. Mm -hmm. I, I only use modeled in place if I really have to use normally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it's nearly all external families, much more stable. Having said that, it, it, depending what the question means exactly, within the families, they're not always parametric. So if there's no particular reason to make something resizable, mm -hmm. uh, it, the geometry is quite complex, mm -hmm. I would always go for just and now, like, modeling place inside the family. You're inside yeah. the external family, you just kind of, it's a bit like modeling in place. So now when, but, when, when you, know, when you did that though, I mean, cause I'm, I'm just trying to imagine if I'm listening to that, how, how would I approach it? Some of these, some of these details, like you're saying, some of these buttresses or windows or something, you know, they would benefit from the, the reference of the model, even if you're in the family environment. So was there an approach you took? Was it, was it using images and snips and uh, for those little vignette models or, or or you know, what, what approach did you take to, to that kind of stuff? Like let's say a unique window on the, on the nave or something like that, and uh, you built it in the family environment like you're saying, of course it's model in place, it doesn't need to be parametric, but you still need it to, to exist within the model itself and, and that as a reference, right, for size and scale and all that? Yeah, well we have the reference material, but yes, there is a lot of, I mean, most families have had two or three iterations. Mm -hmm. on them and sometimes you get a family and say okay we're going to have to scale this down a bit because we've realized now that we gave ourselves too much space in the, mm -hmm. um, it, the grid has changed uh, a couple of times as, as I'm, sure, I'm sure that's fun that, right <laughs> um, as you saw from that initial grid diagram I did that we've gradually evolved a better understanding of the relationship and so on. Mm -hmm. And from doing measurements in that point cloud environment as well, uh, picking up there's a problem here and how can we get... Um, so it's an iterative process of gradually getting to understand the building better and so on. So I do... I, I don't do a lot of model in place, but mm -hmm. I do... I sometimes do an initial model in place then I'll go into edit family, copy paste it into an external family, okay, and then bring it back in, mm -hmm. and then just do a back and forth. I'll go in and do some, you know, and I'll tweak it and then reload it, mm -hmm. check out it, how it's fitting. And so that yeah, that that'll help <laughs> fill in the gaps of the scale and the and the you know wanting to model wanting to model in place because it would be helpful with the scale and relationship to the rest of the project but at the same time now you're in the family environment which makes it much easier to manage after the fact yeah yeah but the, the, um, if you get an i mean a lot of modeling in place it's it's rather fragile and um, you can very easily um distort mm -hmm. some of that stuff Mm -hmm. Not realizing working somewhere else, and you come back the next day and think, "Oh no, what happened to all this stuff?" Right, right, um, right. So, uh, I, right, I'm going to jump. Um, uh, all my preparation is not really. <laughs> oh, here we go. It's a bit faster. Um, so I've, I've put in a bit of a couple of reference images here and there to give a feeling for the kind of stuff we're working, the kind of reference images we're working from. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the upper level. Um, the first set, the first aisles next to the, the nave, the, the, the central space, are on two levels. So this upper level which in English you'd call the Triforium Gallery or sometimes the Tribune Gallery. In French they seem to like to call it the Tribune Gallery. It's a very common feature of, of, of churches. Um, it goes around. It's not really a public area. It's more for the clergy to, to move around. Um, I'm just going to go in here and I'm going to pick up this one um, 
not a very complex one, but it's quite an. I, I, I was really interested in it. Uh, it's probably uh, been working on <laughs> the project for about a year before, or almost a year before I noticed this was a square chair. So it's it's quite a funny. It's nice. You've got left foot, right foot treads, so yeah. it allows you to go kind of deep, and it's built into the wall. Where I've not done the parts built into the wall, but it's what you would. It's often called a cantilever stair, although it's really more of a, a better name is a torsion stair. Right. Where it's, mm -hmm. it's, each tread is supported on three points and has one. It's, it's got a kind of boosting force on it. That's, that's um, awesome. That looks, that looks so neat. Than, um, and it's just one nested component that's got a, a little extra parameter there for I mean, so that was, that's, that I always I love those. <laughs> so it's very simple. Mm -hmm. family editing exercise but um, I always find those very rewarding to understand you see something interesting like that I've never yeah. seen that something like that quite before and then you just do a quick family and you come away with a uh, a much better understanding yeah so I'm sure I'm sure there's tons of that in this building too right I'm sure every little nook and cranny you start to realize those little details even more than, than ever right it, it's been a, an exercise like this Every week we discover something fascinating mm. and new. I mean, that's why I really do this stuff because it's just a constant journey of discovery. So you can see that stair there in that view, and it leads up to a little door which goes through there outside onto a roof space, and then you go into another little door in the side here, up a few stairs, and then you can walk across this. There's a kind of walkway across underneath the rose window, right. and then you come outside again into a little balcony thing, and then you go through another door and into a spiral stair, and then that spiral stair can go all the way up to the roof, and you can walk around the eaves of the roof. It fant they're really fascinating access routes. All the I mean, it's obvious buildings need. Mm. I mean, we always have to think about. How is this building going to be cleaned and all that kind of stuff when we're doing office blocks? And we don't often think of that kind of stuff in relation to old cathedrals. Right. Um, but it's all there. Awesome. Um, so cool. And there's another passage behind those, the Gallery of Kings, all that row of statues there mm -hmm. on the front of the building which is there are more spiral stairs here so coming up the outside of the bell tower and leading to that you can see it in section there um, you go along the gallery there up into the the belfry i think this is where they used to pull the, the ropes and ring the bells but it would be it, you couldn't really ring the bells from up there because you, you would go deaf in the <laughs> Three minutes, I would think. <laughs> I'm so sure. There's actually a little hole in the roof here. Yeah. I, I, by the way, I love, I love these, I love these views, these views that you guys have set up, who are awesome. These little, you know, section vignettes, and then the plans with them, and you know, the level of detail. It's, it's a, it's really, really neat, neat way to, to see this building, especially as a, as a Revit user, <laughs> as these, yeah. as these sheets, and you well, know. Yeah, the value of doing it with the BIM approach yeah. is that you can you can start to now tell the story of the building in a way that I mean I you can get books on Notre Dame and stuff and they have mm -hmm. like artists in Crepin and all that mm -hmm. but you can't boot really a BIM model with carefully nicely thoughtfully laid out sheets and different all the different kinds of views of the one model. Right. Whenever I look at a model that's been done in sketch or whatever <laughs> modeling software and then separately drawn plans and stuff mm -hmm. in a book and visual you you immediately start to spot discrepancies between mm -hmm. between the views and stuff uh, I mean we all all of us who work with Revit are familiar with this I mean especially if you had a significant career before Revit came along working Mm -hmm. in the old the old way mm -hmm. um, you never want to go back to doing that <laughs> and you always spot when people are still drawing every, all the plans and sections independently mm -hmm. and having to use their brain to try and keep things in in synchronization it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't that long ago Andy <laughs> no I mean I I started drawing by hand 
mm-hmm. obviously. And, um, I was like in my, um, I was all, I was 40 really before CAD came along. Autocad. Mm-hmm. I was in my 40s, I used Autocad, and then I was like um, early 50s by the time I started on, uh, on Revit. <clears throat> so here's that little staircase again, you can't get away from it. <laughs> it's nice. a very interesting part of the building. Um, this building was started in 1160, and uh, it was took about a hundred years to be for the first iteration of the building to be complete and opened. And almost immediately they decided to enlarge the window. So you can see on this view here that they actually chopped out a piece of roof in order to enlarge. Because the, the latest style then was to have much larger stained glass windows mm. with light flooding. They got much. The stonemasons got a lot braver about what they could do. Um, this first bay here is how the building originally was, with a small window here and a small window there, and so on. That pink roof highlights what originally it was like. Um, so again, those. Whenever you see a a model, other models, go online to uh, Sketchfab or anywhere like that, you'll see models of Notre Dame Cathedral. But they never pick up this stuff until you actually do it in Revit or some BIM software. Mm-hmm. It's very difficult to pick up all these interesting parts of the history, how it all fits together. Yeah, I mean, even yeah. even um, in, in any building, I think anyone out there who's done existing conditions can relate. You know, when you when you when you measure and take you know, pictures and take plans and then you re you know, remodel or model a building from scratch, even existing buildings, you, you all of a sudden realize all these little finicky details of it that you never ever noticed before and I can't I can only imagine on, on a project like this of this of this type of architecture um, the amount of stuff that comes up like your little staircase that you keep uh, showing views of <laughs> yeah. well it's very when you're drawing plans and sections separately it, you you cheat without realizing it mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, you, you, it's very easy to miss the fact that something doesn't quite match up but when you're using Revit you can't miss it. I mean, if <laughs> you know whatever you do in plan shows up in section, right? And yeah. then you, you say, oh, "Hang on, this doesn't align. What's going on here?" And then you have to figure it out. Um, uh, one very interesting thing is these vaults, the, the ribbed vaults, the Gothic, which is the really the hallmark of, of Gothic architecture. Mm-hmm. And what, what I'd never realised till I started working on this, the flexibility of this structural system that you can actually oh wow you can have vaults that go high on one side so generally speaking originally all the vaults that faced the outside walls went up high hmm. and the one on the inside went down low so sort of bring the light into the building hmm. but this this rib vault system is incredibly flexible in the way it can so in some cases there are vaults that are high on two sides and low on the other two sides, or high on one side. Or there, there's so many variations. Um, it's it's quite um, quite fascinating. So I, I'll jump quickly through. Um, so there, again, we have the windows and the ground floor plan, and um, we have rooms in here. And the, this there's a room schedule here that picks up the, the names and getting the actual. Um, mm-hmm. So I have all these chapels all the way around. Um, they all have specific names and so on. So again, we're getting to the stage where we're starting to embed some useful data, which helps us. We can start to cross relate the data. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so I'm assuming for the for the, for those rooms to work. Um, are you categorizing the exterior walls and all those uh, columns and buttresses and stuff so they're room bounding or or is that yes, are you kind yeah, of building in yeah. boundaries because yeah, I, I can imagine with a lot of these components it can be easy to have leaking spaces right yes we, we there are a few um, room boundary lines in there where where it leaks yes mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The, 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 it's very difficult <laughs> I, yeah, that's the, the, my, my yeah. assumption would be be very difficult to to tighten that thing I mean, up, you right? Can actually see that this is not. I've got to get. 
I think I'll get Daniel to look at it, see if I can figure it out, because this chapel is not, shouldn't be white. <laughs> that should be the pale yellow. <laughs> But Got it. Yeah. I'm, at, I'm sure you've had this problem. Oh, I think everyone out there has, <laughs> and it especially when you're doing things. when you're doing a lot of. It could, be yeah. it could be the fact that the floor is higher at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, when the room starts at a different level or something like that, you have issues. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, there was somebody who, who asked a question about the vaults too. So maybe uh, I think do you have a view set up for the, to dig into the vaults a little bit? Or yes, let, let me try and um, get the. We can spot it. Somebody also asked how many. Uh, how many? Where is it? Well, first somebody asked if there was any phasing in the model. I'm assuming maybe they're talking about the fact that there was it was sort of built in phases and in memory you mentioned the sort of lower higher. Um, yeah, we actually have we actually have Paul and Alfredo and and a few others in here answering questions, which is awesome. Thanks, guys, appreciate it. Um, but uh, I think uh, Paul Paul doesn't think there are phases, but um, I guess I'll, I'll let you answer since you got the model open as well. Um, at the moment, we haven't used phasing in in the model. Um, it would be an interesting thing to do. It, um, I would love to do that, but it does take a toll. That um, would definitely uh, take a toll. I'm, I'm uh, assuming uh, it would, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, yeah. But at the moment, uh, it, it's there's only the it, there's no phasing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, look at these vaults, huh? That that perspective ceiling plan is freaking awesome. <laughs> <clears throat> Man, it looks so, so cool. Uh, this is a uh, resected ceiling plan on, on the ground floor, and it, it, um, we've coded the different kinds of vaults here. So, Alfredo did quite a bit of work on the vault there. There's some of my vaults here, some of his vaults mixed, uh, sort of joint exercise, I suppose. And we've not got it right yet. <laughs> I hasten to say um, they need more work. We've got an eight part, eight part vaults in the bell towers, four-part vaults from type Bs. Then the Cs are four-part but higher on the outside. Mm -hmm. The Ds are the six-part vaults on the nave. So you've got mm -hmm. the, the two arches on the sides and the, the one big arch on the east and west sides there. They, they, they work. And then down at the apse on the east end in the curve here, mm -hmm. you have what I call the zigzag vaults, which are they kind of triangular void. So, so you've got a situation where you've got two arches on one side going to three arches on the other side. Hmm. Um, again, I've got no idea about this configuration until we started on this. <laughs> uh, of course, if if you, um, I mean, I have family in, in the UK still, um, son and grandson. So I, I visit old cathedrals in the UK. And you see one thing here, and then now every time you visit a cathedral, You've never seen it before. In your you life. notice it, you yeah. It you start seeing it everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> these wow. drawings here are fascinating. These are by um, the guy who restored the cathedral in the 19, uh, 19th century, Villela, Eugene Villela Le Duc. Um, he's an amazing guy. And, uh, he, uh, Alfredo came across um, copies of books that he wrote, and he has these fantastic drawings. Um, so I'm going. If how, are we still okay for time? Uh, yeah, yeah. We we just do about an hour. Um, so we still have about 20 minutes. Um, I was gonna ask so if <laughs> I was gonna ask if it's dangerous if it's dangerous to get in there, but you're already doing it. So go for it, man. <laughs> um, so I don't know this very well. I just put um, to look, and I'm not going to try and pretend I understand it completely or whatever. Um, but. It's all done in with what I call point world, so it's adaptive stuff. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a there are a family that's repeated four times here, and um, within that you have some the arches are nested components, and then the actual vaults are surfaces which are done with the kind of conceptual massing approach to 
doing the service. So if I just dissolve that service to show, basically it's a sequence of curved line, three point curves, mm -hmm. which you select and then you create form and you get this, uh, uh, this thing. And in this case, um, it's just, as far as I can see, it's just kind of been built as a fixed size mm -hmm. item. Um, he did do a four part vault which scales up and down. Yeah, I think I, think I saw um, Paul mentioned, I believe, in the comments, a few comments back, that um, he did a class at AU, I think, um, on on how, how he created the vault. So I guess if yeah. those of you guys have yeah. access to that, um, I don't know what year it was, but... He had a lab, actually. Yeah. Okay. It was a really great lab, which, um, yeah, that went down really well. Awesome. It was very interesting thing we did. Where that needs to be extended now is it was done on a square base, mm -hmm. so uh, there aren't many of his of those families in the model at present because most of the vaults are rectangular. Mm. Um, so there's a much clunkier vault <laughs> that I made um, in there, and also this thing of some higher on the outside. Thing. So let me get oh, jump okay. in. It. By comparison, this is a vault that I, I built more recently. I'm not fully happy with it, but it's interesting. It's not. It's, it has different problems. Um, so this one, this is the um, component. This is it, it, one of the one things I like about it. It's got the thickness of the material, in mm, it. mm -hmm. and it's all done with standard. This is not. Um, it's all done, it's, it's not adaptive, it's, it's all done with standard from the editor. So, and um, don't ask me to explain how it is because I can't remember. Um, well, I see, there, I see some, I see some, some, some cones and a few things going on. <laughs> yeah, it, there's, there's a, basically a revolver, yep. a dome, a revolver. So the, all the parts of the shell are portions of, of spherical surface. Mm -hmm. And then you have that, that void which cuts out a triangular portion of it. Mm -hmm. And then it's set up so that, uh, with various parameters, so that the position of the triangle can move around. And then depending where you put that triangle on that dome, you get a different shape. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the Sydney Opera House in a way. If mm -hmm. you, like, you get yeah. all the different shell shapes <laughs> and you can get them. Wow. to work in different ways. Mm -hmm. What I don't remember is what all this stuff is. <laughs> I mean, I spent like a couple of days, one weekend sitting and working all this and scribbling on bits of paper and I got it to work, but I can't remember. I'd have to, uh, it'd take me a couple of hours to remember how, what all that, <laughs> how I came to those conclusions. That's, that's usually how it goes, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it certainly does with me. <laughs> but it kind of works and um, you can get so what you end up with is um, the main parameters the operational parameters here mm -hmm. uh, you can set the depth and the width so it works on a rectangular basis, mm -hmm. base not just a square mm -hmm. and the x1, x2, x3, x4 are the heights above a kind of default height mm -hmm. of these four arches on the edge. So at the moment you can see there are two which are two meters up and the other two are 200 millimeters up. So that's why there are two high and two low. So if I take one of those and reduce it to 200, uh, you can see that's three parts of the mm -hmm. low of one part. Of the high. So it's it's an interesting family and it's quite flexible. Mm -hmm. One of the problems is that, by the way, it's made, it doesn't quite, as we change, yeah. as it gets more rectangular, it doesn't meet quite so neatly mm -hmm. there. So I don't know. The, it's a, the vaults are a huge challenge and um, it's an ongoing, we've learnt a huge amount, mm -hmm. uh, there's more work to be done on the vaults. Yeah, no, I love I love the the idea of of approaching it with the consent or the the traditional family editor and how you you know the taking a, a 
a, a sphere or a half dome and slicing it and, and stuff. I mean, that, that to me is super exciting when you're modeling existing stuff, trying to figure out, you know, how, how to simplify it down to, to revolves, extrusions, sweeps. You know what I mean? I, I mean, uh, to me, yeah, yeah, to me, uh, when you do that, uh, it's that's a it's a really I really fun challenge. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't do everything. But no, yeah. no, but but it makes you it, think it, like you were doing there, where you're, you're something you as com yeah something as complex as you know the, these these gothic you know vaults. You, know, you can you broke it down into well, it's just a, a dome with you know some triangle sliced out of it. Like boom, you know, yeah. <laughs> like that's 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 awesome. That's I mean, I got that idea from from this drawing by, uh, here, which shows how they actually construct the site. So they make these ribs, mm -hmm. and then to infill between the ribs, they have this little device which is two pieces of wood with curved slots mm -hmm. and wedges. So you can change, it's, it's a constant curvature hmm. and you can change the length of it. So you put the first few stones in and then as soon as it's long enough to put this in, you put the, that along the top edge and you lay a start, you, you rest it on the, the course below and then you support the top edge on this curve and then you just keep going up and up and up like that. So it's, it's a fascinating device and that's what made me think Mm -hmm. If that's a constant curvature that they're using, this must be a portion of a dome. Mm -hmm. It's all got the same radius. Right. So it must be a spherical surface that, that's filling in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's what set me off trying to work that out. So cool. Uh, a couple of people asked uh, about materials. Um, I think I remember, uh, I mean, it looks like there's definitely some materials applied here, just from the shaded views. I think I remember you showing some Enscape views. Um, so I assume that uh, that you guys have have been applying for the most part materials to this. There's Enscape yes, right there. Here we, we go. We need to do more work on the materials, really. Hmm. So this is the Enscape. I'll I'll run around the Enscape model uh, a little bit. Um, so let me just dive inside. Wow, look at that. So we do have quite a nice um, material that Daniel uh, worked on for the coarse stonework inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really, really nice texture. I can tell just, just from the quick yeah. quick shot of it. Yeah. This, Ryan did all this stuff, the, the choir and the organ, all this sort of more detailed woodwork um, um, was, was done by Ryan. It's done a really, really nice job of that. If I, let me just slide down along to the, so these are those mm -hmm. uh, Tribune, Triforium galleries. Wow. Uh, along the side there, so you can kind of, I mean, I could talk about this. <laughs> no, no, this is great. I think, I think everyone is probably absolutely loving the fact that you just jumped into Enscape to see this on this scale. I mean, one, yeah. of the, one of the things I talk about all the time is is we get so used to Revit ortho views of buildings that like it's programs like Enscape or Twinmotion or Lumion, it, it's it's always nice to to jump in and, and get the human perspective again because it is so easy to lose perspective when you're in a Revit ortho 3D view. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just you just you, you, you work in it for so long on a building and you almost lose the lose the, the human perspective of everything. This it's fantastic with a, if you put a headset on as well. Oh yeah, I'm uh, sure. You, I can imagine. You, you see so much more. Um, that's uh, um, that's that little staircase again. There it is. You love that staircase, huh, Andy? <laughs> oh, I got that. Yeah. And you can go. Uh, let me just dive through the wall here, and um, You can look back. That's the door comes out there, mm -hmm. and then you get onto the roof, and then you go through this little door here, mm -hmm. up some steps. You walk along there, and then if we um, let me just oops, uh, I think I need to change the time of day a bit. Yeah, you see, you come out here a little door, you get into the balcony, then you can go through into the spiral stairs. Mm -hmm. You can come out here and go across. Here. There are all these little galleries everywhere. That rose window looks phenomenal in Enscape. Yes, that, <laughs> this is Alfredo's thing. 
That looks awesome. Looks great. Um, let's jump up to that little. Not farm gallery there, and then this is the one rose window where we've got a proper where we've actually um, mapped on stained glass. It looks like we've got a, a mapped wow. material, with, which is really. Mm -hmm. Which I'm sure was quite the task in Revit, just from experience. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wow, look at that. That was one of the other guys in Paris who, who did that, got hold of the window and, and put it into the material and got it set up. That was um, great. Maybe people would be interested in these statues. How would you Yeah, I was just gonna, I was going to ask if someone else did it. Who, who took on the challenge of these statues? So... Um, the statues are all they're not what they should they look they look like statues but they don't look like the actual statues <laughs> okay <laughs> uh, and they were sourced by um russell in um, australia um so here's this is one i can edit so he he found them um, he does quite a lot of this kind of work mm -hmm. and um, so he's quite good at sourcing these kind of mesh models mm -hmm. so you see this is the family and this is just direct extrusion geometry mm -hmm. and then here this is a planting family called statue so this uses yeah. a double nested planting trick mm -hmm. so you can see the height is two meters so if I make that three meters um, it will scale up yeah, I guess uh, just since we're talking about it and people on here always like to get tips, um, one of the reasons you guys, if you've opened up Enscape um, assets, for example, or in general, if you've ever seen something that's set to planting, um, part of the reason is what Andy just showed. And uh, there's a lot of a lot of information on it if you look it up. But if you're thinking why on earth is this you know statue or furniture piece planting, it's because when you import mesh into planting, um, you can scale it like Andy just showed you. And it's the only, if I'm if I'm correct, I think it's the only family type that lets you scale a mesh like that, a category, I should in, say. In, in that way, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the only one that lets you do a... a, 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 a yeah, exactly. Global, global scaling, yes. <laughs> exactly. Um, so cool. But this is actually nested inside another family. So in the project, you don't, you're not aware this is a planting object. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, so, so you buried, yeah, you buried um, the category into the family. Planting. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then if you edit that, you'll see there's another, you have to have a planting object inside a pla planting family, inside a planting family. Mm -hmm. You just make a planting family, it doesn't scale. So all so this, all the statues are meshes that, that, that were found? So, um, most of them? Yeah. So those are, um, that's, a, that's the nested family. And if I edit the nested family, there are actually two mesh objects there. There's one that's that's higher resolution than the other. So you uh, did detail, detail that, levels? So, yeah. yeah. Awesome. But also the fact that um, if... Let me isolate that. There it is. So that's the <laughs> higher resolution mesh, and it's that horrible thing you always get with meshes in Revit, where it just looks disgusting. Yeah. all the time but <laughs> edges if, edges um, man edges <laughs> if I, well, you can hide the edges mm -hmm. there is a trick you can do in 3d there's max um if if i put this on preview visibility this is the and if i put it on shaded mm -hmm. that's a, a coarser you could you yeah. have to export through um, DFX format for this trick to work, mm -hmm. and th there's a limit on the number of polygons that work that it'll work on through through this particular method. There may be other methods you can do with higher polygons, mm -hmm. but from my point of view, I don't want huge polygon counts in my yeah. Revit model mm -hmm. really because um, so this one is is okay for me because you can tell what it is yeah it looks nice yeah mm -hmm. um, it's okay in Enscape but it's not too heavy mm -hmm. um, yes yeah, so somebody asked uh, if, if they knew how the mesh was made and 
And uh, I think Alfredo answered, uh, I think it was this one was in brush Z or most of them. But I think the, the answer in general, I think, is that it really doesn't really matter as long as you're coming out. You know, it could be 3D Max, it could be Mo Modo, it could be brush Z. I mean, you go through the list. But the reality is you're, you're exporting that whatever format, like you're saying, you know, exporting to DXF or whatever makes sense. And, and that's, that, that to me is the key, right? And I think once you get to meshes, it doesn't make a huge difference um, as long as you have the options for that, 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 that right size polygon export, I would say. Yeah, the, the, we just got through uh, 3DS Max. And mm -hmm. um, so any format that will go into 3DS Max, then mm -hmm. you have to go through a little process to, to tell it to hide all the edges. Okay, so, so, you're, so you're using 3DX Max to, to, to hide the edges and make it look better in Revit, yeah. right? So, so I guess the, the reality is you could technically bring in, hidden, yeah, okay. To get yeah. those hidden, hidden edges to show up as hidden in Revit, Got you it. have to export it to DFX, mm -hmm. DXF, DXF, mm -hmm. and awesome. then, bring it, then bring it into Revit. So cool. Um, but this 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 statue, um, a number of the statues were just they were just found online. Russell just found them online. Mm -hmm. There are some statues, the the grotesques. Um, there's an elephant and a, a crane, I think, that was mm -hmm. done by Ryan. Those were done directly in, in uh, 3ds Max. Got it. Got it. Modeled directly, but these are the ones that are just found on the internet. Mm -hmm. They're just stuff that um, Russell just really good at going on there to what um, <laughs> thing either is it or all these yeah. funny websites and yep. coming I don't, sometimes they're free sometimes you pay you know three dollars mm -hmm. or whatever it is awesome um, well so before because uh, we're, we're going to hit the hour mark soon so I want to make sure Andy that you is there anything else that you're I mean you're obviously we could we could spend hours just diving through this model clearly which is fantastic but maybe is there is there anything before we wrap up that you really wanted to show and, and point out to, to everyone that's here uh, before we kind of tie it all up um, no, I think it's diff uh, everything. I, think. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, I, I could tell. I could tell just from from people's comments, and and I mean, any one of us who who, who have the would have the ability to open this model would probably just love to poke around for hours just looking at all these great things you guys did. So, uh, if anybody's interested in this kind of work, it's an open source project. We have this one. We have the Bank of England. We mm -hmm. probably will try and do more. So, anybody wants to get involved. Um, oh, the one question actually, I think uh, I, I saw two or three people ask was, you know, how long has what you what you see here? How long has it taken so far? And sort of, I guess it's hard to gauge because multiple people worked on it. But maybe just in general, from when 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 you guys decided to start this project until now. I well, guess. we started we started soon after the fire. Okay, so almost eighteen months. April, so it's over a year we've mm -hmm. been working on this model. And you said there's um, probably about seven, I five work, to seven people. Probably most, I probably spent about two thirds of the weekends mm -hmm. of that process working on it. Uh, hours, I mean, hundreds and hundreds. My time has been hundreds of hours. <laughs> um, so, I think I've spent more time than anybody <laughs> on it. But, uh, yeah, so, so a decent amount of time. There was some been some time in it. <laughs> my passion. This is my passion. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's absolutely beautiful. It's so cool, so cool. Um, so yeah, I think uh, if you want to stop sharing your screen so we can see your face again, <laughs> and then uh, and then we'll wrap yeah. some things up here. Um, hopefully, uh, I put, hopefully everyone enjoyed that. That was freaking awesome. I think as you mentioned before, uh, it's an open source project, and I know. Um, you're more than willing to chat about it with anyone. So, I mean, where where can people find you, and where where should they reach out to to sort of get more information if they're really interested in either joining the project or just chatting more about it? What's the best best route? Um, well, you can. Um, I haven't got a thing to bring up there, but you you can check out my blog. Yep. So I'll post a link. Uh, uh, I'll post a link in the chat right now, and I'll also post a link. Um, in the comments you below if you're looking at this in the future. Yeah, get me on LinkedIn and ask to connect or whatever. I um, um, the, the only people I refuse to connect with are people who are selling cheap <laughs> BIM services and that kind of thing. You, know? you don't want a rendering service? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> outsourcing. I don't, I'm not very keen on outsourcing BIM. But anybody who has a genuine interest and wants me to hook up and have a good chat, that's fine. Awesome. I'm all in 
Great. Um, well, man, this was great. I, I, I just want to say that a big part of this project has been the collaboration. Mm -hmm. the, the fact that there are a dozen of us who, some of us knew each other already, uh, some of us totally knew, met each other through the project, and the camaraderie and the, the just the learning from each other has been fantastic. It's, it's a terrific thing to do from my point of view. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. Well, no, I, I really appreciate you taking the time and sharing this. I think this was super cool, super valuable to see. I think seeing, seeing is believing when it comes to this. I know a lot of people don't believe that you can, you can actually physically do this in Revit. And so look at you can, <laughs> with some caveats, but you can. Um, so thank you so much for joining me and everyone else for hanging out this long. Thank you. If you enjoyed it, make sure you subscribe to my channel on YouTube. You can check me out at uh, the Revit Kid on Twitter or shoot me an email at therevitkid.com, whatever. And uh, yeah, uh, we'll be, I think I'm going to try and do the normal time next week, which is episode number 20, which is crazy. Um, and so if you have any ideas of what I should do to celebrate 20, let me know. Uh, Andy, thank you again so much uh, for joining me. I really appreciate this. And, uh, My pleasure. Thanks, yeah. Jeff. Yeah, no, no problem. So everyone else, have a, have, a lovely, have a lovely week or weekend, depending on where you are. Hopefully you all have power and internet, unlike me. And, uh, <laughs> and stay safe, everyone.